Welcome aboard. This is the Admiral's Almanac, your leadership life connection. Bringing leaders from all walks of life into yours so you can take charge, improve your leadership, and improve your life. With the wit and wisdom of your host, Rear Admiral Gary Hall. Hey, thank you for that great introduction. I'm Gary Hall, your host. Please subscribe to the Admiral's Almanac wherever you get your podcast. Today, what a great opportunity, and it's been long in coming. But my guest today is Rear Admiral Paul Becker, a Navy two-star admiral and an intelligence professional, keynote speaker. And I'm going to call you, Paul, a stage four cancer warrior and he's the founder of T3 Leadership, which we'll get into. Welcome aboard, Paul. My honor, Gary. Well, I mentioned uh, you're a stage four cancer warrior because I felt like saying you were a stage four cancer survivor is kind of passive, like you survived. But in reality, uh, according to the medical community and yourself and testimony, you were the warrior that freaking killed uh, this cancer and multiple myeloma. Would you agree with me? Well, I didn't kill it, uh, but for now, uh, we have the upper hand. Good. But, I mean, it was you, you active participant, and I think your T3 leadership, which we'll get into, um, helped uh, help get you to this point where you're in remission and have it under control. You bet. Uh, my watchwords are teamwork, tone, tenacity, but they can be applied to overcoming extreme adversity rather than just everyday leadership situations as well. And sometimes you may need some extra help. And when you're on the ropes and the outcome's uncertain, uh, as I was uh, as a stage four diagnosis uh, bone marrow cancer patient, uh, faith, family, fitness, Uh, also come into play. And we could talk more about that because there's direct applicability uh, to leadership situations in crisis during all that. Absolutely. So um, I like your alliterations. You have three F's, three T's, but let's get in the uh, Admiral's Wayback Machine and dial it back to when you were in high school. Where'd you, where'd you grow up? What was your founding I I was born and grew up for the first nine years of my life in the Bronx. Uh, The first body of water I ever saw was the local reservoir. That probably wasn't enough uh, to make me uh, join the Navy. I I didn't know I'd uh, enter the Navy until I was in 11th grade. And my dad sat me down uh, at our family uh, kitchen table, which was his office, after mom cleared away the supper dishes. He explained to me the Becker family financial facts of life and asked me which service academy I'd be applying to next year. <laughs> and that was the first heard uh, for me, and I looked into it, and uh, the Navy uh, appealed to me for the following reasons. Uh, I had seen many uh, war movies on our old black and white console TV when I was growing up, or in the theaters. And uh, I knew the Army and the Marine Corps were very dangerous professions. Uh, The Navy was no less dangerous, just in a different environment, but uh, one role model appealed to me, and that was Lieutenant Commander Quinton McHale, you know, who led (laughs) McHale's Navy in the South Pacific. And even though he was in the fight, Gary, it still looked like he was having fun on the sidelines uh, when he wasn't in combat. And uh, I I thought uh, I could I could do that. No, uh, Mikhail's Navy, what a great uh, sitcom. Maybe you can find it at Nick on uh, night. And one time I said, I I knew every one of those sailors. And somebody went, you did? And I go, metaphorically. I mean, if you think of his entire crew, we met uh, uh, through our careers, uh, uh, those sailors. I mean, you can't make this uh, stuff up. So you wound up going to the Naval Academy. And uh, what class were you? I was from the class of 83. And I was commissioned as an intel officer, and I was quite sure I'd stay five years and become Mr. Becker, Uh, except at the five-year point, I was uh, enjoying my work, I was enjoying my shipmates, and I was enjoying the diversity of uh, assignments that I was being offered. Uh, If I stayed, we could go to Italy 
uh, and that appealed to my wife and I. Uh, so fast forward, that brought us to 20. And that was for sure when I thought I'd get out at that nice round number with a 50% base pay retirement, except uh, two months after I arrived for what I thought would be my final duty station, uh, it was 9-11. And uh, I participated in the earliest phases of Operation Enduring Freedom from an aircraft carrier in the Northern Arabian Sea. And then a couple of years later, uh, for the earliest phases of Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, where I was uh, forward staged uh, at uh, an Air Force location in the Saudi desert. So now I was at 20, and I had a different perspective on leaving the Navy. I had just participated in two wars. They were both still active. Uh, it just didn't seem the right time uh, to leave the service. And that became another 13-year stretch, and I finally left in, in 2016. Wow. And I think that's the perspective that you have is a lot of people think, uh, oh, we signed up at age 18, 19, went to the Naval Academy and knew that we were going to spend 30 plus years and become admirals when really uh, we did it one step at a time. I know that's how I looked at it. Uh, I got to that five year, seven year as an aviator and uh, thought about getting out. And I found out that the um, issues that uh, I met with people in the Navy were also there out in the civilian world. And uh, I, I always like to say um, the three reasons I joined is why I think probably you did adventure opportunity. And then associate, I call it association with heroes. The young men and women you serve with are, are just totally awesome. And so, you know, when you hang out with the uh, heroes, I mean, Life just goes well. So, yeah, spot on for the, the reasons to join. Uh, all four of my grandparents immigrated to the United States. Uh, so, I don't come from a, a long military uh, background. Uh, the opportunity part uh, and adventure really uh, appealed to me. And along the way, uh, my grandma uh, would uh, often say, It sounds funnier in Yiddish, but man plans, God laughs. Uh, and that can happen with your professional milestones. It can happen with your personal health. Right? It can happen with your social life. And you put that all together and uh, part of the package for 33 years in uniform. Now, man plans, God laughs. Do you know how to say it in Yiddish? No longer. Oh, no. I'm rusty. No, no. Okay. But uh, no, absolutely. And I always say that uh, I did better in my career with the cards I was dealt rather than the cards I tried to draw, which is kind of the uh, the same thing as taking opportunity. So I think a, a learning point there is uh, when you're handed an assignment, whether it be in the civilian world or in the military world, work it real hard, be the best at it, and it's the most important job you'll ever have and other opportunities will come from there. Yes, sir. You're a good Stoic. Marcus Aurelius would be proud of your perspective. So so you, you commissioned as an intel officer, and like you said, you got to the five-year point, and you went, well, this is kind of fun, and there's adventure and opportunity. What was, you know, what is the life like of a young intelligence officer? Uh, I was attached to, to an aviation squadron, an A6 intruder uh, attack squadron, and uh, we made a couple of cruises along the way. So the daily life of an A6 squadron intel officer uh, was to make sure that the aviators in your command knew all about potential threats at sea uh, and ashore because we could project power uh, forward from the sea uh, to the Soviet Union was uh, the main uh, effort uh, of our planning back then, but uh, also uh, terrorism uh, was quite a significant threat to the United States uh, and its population at the time, mainly focused in the Mediterranean and Middle East. It hadn't come to our shores yet. Uh, so one cruise uh, to the North Atlantic uh, to message to the Russians, one cruise to the Mediterranean uh, where we would support national security uh, efforts uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So it was about understanding what the enemy didn't want us to know. There are a lot of fancy definitions of intelligence. 
but it's ultimately finding out what your enemy doesn't want you to know. So as an intel officer, you're trying to find that out. Where are the hostages? Where are their key communication nodes? Where are their weapon systems? What are the capabilities of their weapon system? What is the intent of the enemy? What do they want to do? What will they do next? You know, we're uh, having this conversation just a couple of days short of the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Midway in the Pacific. Uh, and the, the key intel officers there, Commander Joe Rochefort and Lieutenant Commander Ed Layton uh, of the Pacific Fleet, right, they broke a Japanese code which ultimately deciphered the intent of the enemy and they could present that to Admiral Nimitz and provide him with decision advantage to maneuver his task forces of Admiral Spruance and Fletcher. Uh, that plus the daring do, the courage, and the commitment uh, of all uh, pieces of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, even a little bit of Army flying uh, from the shore uh, in Midway, you know, contributed to that momentous victory. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, so Intel doesn't have to be classified. I mean, we have uh, unclass, class, uh, um, confidential, secret, and top secret. And so Intel can come from uh, any any source. Now, when I worked for General Tommy Franks, I think he had a very succinct method of talking about intelligence. And he said, we need to take data and turn it into information to facilitate a conversation in order to make an informed decision. Yeah, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice pyramid. You know, think of data. Uh, it's everywhere. It's wide. It's, it's the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, add some perspective to it. Give it some analysis and context. Then you move up into the information world. And then I'd uh, call it knowledge or ultimately for a warfighter or a policymaker, decision advantage uh, at the pinnacle so one can employ their forces. I'd also add about intelligence. Uh, you know, it's finding out what the enemy doesn't want you to know. It's also protecting what you don't want the enemy to know. Right. And, and that has implications for modern day cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, there's physical uh, aspects to it as well in classic espionage or insider threat uh, type environments. Yeah. And I think uh, in today's world, the challenge of uh, cybersecurity and just, uh, you know, practicing cyber hygiene, but also uh, social media and for our deployed forces. I mean, they've got to be very careful with the social media and also uh, social gatherings because when you and I were um, working together, I'll flip over the cards. We worked uh, at Fifth Fleet in Bahrain in the Middle East. Paul was the Admiral's intelligence officer and I was the expeditionary strike group commander, but we planted um, rumors at social events that uh, um, would prevent the enemy, if you will, to uh, not know what we're doing or think we're doing something else, and uh, including, um, uh, uh, you know, a fake, creating a fake battle group is uh, Kevin Quinn and I went out to the oil rigs and, uh, you know, pointed toward Iran and made a, a photo opportunity. So, uh, a lot of fun there, but using social media, social events, et cetera. Any experience in that that you can talk about in an unclass environment? Yes, I'm a former uh, attaché in France. I was the assistant naval attaché uh, from 1997 to 2000. So, scene setter, uh, this is pre-European Union, right, the, the pre-Euro. Uh, it's still the French Frank and, uh, and Franco-American relations were outstanding at the time. Our, our commander-in-chief uh, was uh, President Clinton. Our ambassador was Pamela Harriman uh, and then uh, Felix Royten a bit after that. And uh, the U.S. and France and all of NATO participated in a significant operation. Uh, you'll recall it, Operation Allied Force, uh, which was against the former Yugoslavia, mostly Serbia. So we worked very closely together with the French, uh, both planning, analyzing, 
uh, disseminating uh, after we collected information about how the battle was going. So that was a very rewarding assignment, uh, plus uh, the the benefits after work uh, were great in terms of uh, food and drink and travel. Yeah, uh, drinking for your country. So, uh, you know, as you get to this point, um, what were so were you developing the T3 leadership thought process at that point? And again, um, does it matter which order the T's are mentioned, but uh, I'll call it uh, teamwork, tone, and tenacity. So it, were you starting to develop that uh, during this, you know, during these formative years? Yeah, that, that was about uh, the point. I really started thinking uh, of it uh, and uh, came to fruition uh, a couple of assignments later. Uh, I'll be more specific. As an intel officer, I was all often a lone representative in my profession uh, on a staff. I, I didn't have many people working for me. Right, I, I was a specialist uh, in many regards. So I didn't have the opportunity in the classic sense of managing or leading an organization of, you know, several to, to large amounts of people. Uh, but in Paris, uh, I had my first taste of it uh, with a, a small group. Uh, and then a couple of assignments uh, later, uh, I was afloat uh, with aircraft carrier John C. Stennis, and then uh, the, the tour after that with our Pacific Command headquarters in Hawaii, where I had increasingly uh, complex problem sets and increasingly large, diverse groups of people, officers, enlisted, civilian, active duty, reserve, men, women, which weren't on uh, ships the, the first time I went out there, some international components as well. And uh, what were the tools that I saw of great leaders along the way that helped bring units together and make them high-performing organizations? And you know those green division officer notebooks that we are issued uh, in, in almost all the armed uh, services? I still have a stack of them, and I took good notes of the leaders I admired and frankly, the leaders that I didn't admire along the way. Uh, every opportunity uh, was there to either say, I'd like to do that, or I want to make sure I avoid that. So what were the three characteristics? And I thought the very best of the leaders that I saw in peace, crisis, and combat were ones that built trust and loyalty and relationships, and that's, resulted, that's what resulted in teamwork. Right? It's, it's very easy to say, let's form a team. Uh, it's not easy unless you have relationships, you develop trust, and the byproduct of trust is loyalty. And the best teams I ever saw, some I was a part of, some I just admired from afar, they were loyal to each other. And you even look at Medal of Honor citations from small units, right? It, it's not that the individual awardee uh, had superior courage. I think most of them will tell you they were pretty scared. But they were doing it out of loyalty to their fellow uh, service members. That, that's a loyalty uh, and a trademark of a high-performing team. Tone, uh, these were the leaders that instilled a culture a mood, a sense of belonging and inclusiveness and a demonstration that they really cared, right? When they walked around instead of sitting at their desk and they asked how you were doing, no, they meant it. They wanted an answer, right? right? Yeah, that was really important. And if you ever sent them an email, right, it didn't sit in their inbox for days and with no response or sometimes even worse is you get an okay. Thanks. Uh, Matt, you, and you think about that. It's a very tactical uh, example, but it really can set a, a positive tone for a command uh, if you, you think how hard you've worked as an action officer on a project. You got to send it to your boss. You send it via email, uh, could be delivered verbally. But if you don't get any response, you don't know if you've hit the mark. Right. And I found that disincentivizing for me to want to work that hard again. But the very best 
of those I saw along the way, they would take time out. They weren't slaves to their computer at all. But when it was time for them to hit the computer, time me on this. How long does it take to type this out, Gary? Paul, thanks. Really valuable. I'm adding a few people on the CC line. Boom. Well, that was uh, three or four seconds. Yeah. Oh, those leaders, if they took three or four seconds and hit reply all, they just, motivi- they just motivated me to send an even better uh, input next time. And it's shared, right, with a wide audience that the boss thinks I'm doing okay. Right. Right. And, and, and this isn't a kumbaya experience. This is an inclusivity uh, example of how leaders can create a positive tone and culture. The best way they can do that, frankly, uh, though, is to, to be people of integrity. And by that, uh, I'd say uh, their words must match their deeds. Right? As long as there's not a say-do mismatch, people will trust you. And right. if they trust you, they will be loyal with you. And, you know, frankly, this is a problem in many aspects of society. You know, uh, across the board right now that uh, people are not loyal to each other because right now they don't trust each other and they haven't uh, built those relationships. So back to teamwork tone. And then the third T, tenacity. Uh, Tenacity is more than endurance. Okay, It's, it's not running a marathon. It's not getting around the D.C. beltway during rush hour. You know, that's just endurance on its own. Uh, tenacity is perseverance with a purpose, right? It's knowing what the end state looks like. And as long as it's ethically, uh, morally, and and professionally uh, okay, pursue it, go through it, around it, underneath it, over it, right? It's 99% perspiration, doesn't need to be all that inspiration as, uh, uh, as Edison Uh, you know, was fond of saying. So you put them together, and these are the three T's. And I like the sequence uh, that you add. uh, I'm often asked, which is more important? Uh, But I see them as an equilateral triangle. Sometimes it's not an equilateral triangle, right? It may be, if I have my geometry correct, an isosceles triangle, because you may have a very short uh, short leg, Right. That's the tone. Uh, But you have long legs on teamwork and tenacity. Okay, now there's something to build upon. Right. And this is something a leader can focus on. How do we improve the mood, the culture, the climate, the tone uh, of the organization? Because we're already good in these areas. Uh, But because it's a triangle, I'd also caution uh, you need all three legs. If you just have two of the three. That's not a shape. It's right. just two lines. It's an open-ended stick figure, and it'll collapse on itself. So the third leg gives it structure. So uh, there's that. Plus, I'm a big believer in cognitive studies, which prove uh, that our human mind best processes things in groups of threes. And whether it's on your mark, get set, go, uh, earth, wind, fire, uh, you, you can you can pick out any others. There's teamwork, tone, tenacity. And uh, I would put it in writing. I would include this in my equivalent of commander's intent. And this way, when the poo hit the fan, <laughs> uh, whether in peace or crisis or combat, uh, our team knew what to fall back on. You know, what, what do we do as teammates? You know, what do we do? Uh, when our tone is tested, uh, and what do we do for tenacity when the going gets rough? Uh, absolutely, and I, I do believe in the um, the trilogy and the triangle. You know, and I go back to boot camp about learning about uh, the fire triangle. You know, you need uh, a source, you need uh, heat, and you need oxygen. Take away any one of those, and uh, the fire goes out. So, like you say, take away teamwork, tone, or tenacity in the the, the leadership goes away. Now, um, you also mentioned the say do, you know, uh, does say do match what you say and what you do match. And 
I came up with, uh, you know, watching a, a leader that I did not like. And I came up with the reverse proclamation rule. And that uh-huh. was some leaders, you'll hear them say, I'm a people person. If you have to proclaim you're a people person, I guarantee you that person is not going to be a people person. And there's other uh, reverse proclamations. But usually if a, if a leader has to go out and, uh, you know, uh, yell about his, uh, you know, positive attributes um, rather than displaying them, uh, the opposite is probably true. So what, what a great um, analogy of uh, teamwork, tone, and tenacity. And we saw it in, uh, as you said, in conflict, in stress, in combat. Um, those that know you know that you have a pleasant personality and uh, um, a humor. You're not a jokester, but you have uh, um, a lighthearted approach to many things. Do you think that helped you uh, in your career? Uh, very much so. Uh, I take my work very seriously. Uh, I worked hard as an Intel officer, and uh, I'm proud of uh, the different assignments and the accomplishments uh, in each. Uh, but I never took myself seriously. Right? Uh, when I was growing up, I loved the Borscht Belt comedians. You know, uh, you know, Henny Youngman and, you know, Milton Berle. And my favorite of all time is Mel Brooks. And, you know, and God bless him. He's still uh, around. And did you know, Gary, Mel Brooks uh, was an Army combat engineer. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Wow. Uh, I, I, in one uh, interview with him, he, he highlighted that the two things he, were, he hated wor- worst in life were engineering and combat. <laughs> you know, so, uh, of course, he, you know, he made his name as a combat engineer at the Battle of the Bulge. No, uh, and Mel Brooks is one of, is my favorite, and of course, uh, anytime I can watch Young Frankenstein, I will watch that. But uh, also, whenever he did the two thousand year old man, I mean, such subtle humor. But you always added um, a, a lightness to the process, and uh, and you do speak truth to power when you say you took your job serious, but you didn't take yourself serious. I mean, we had a lot of uh, fun while spending a year together uh, in the in the Middle East. And I think too, when you have a lighthearted approach in your personality, you got to work harder to show people uh, you're not getting things done because of uh, humor or pleasantries, but uh, you're getting it done because you can be counted on. So let's transition to uh, multiple myeloma. And it's a, it's a difficult uh, cancer. Um, I lost my mother to it and it was, uh, I think, uh, um, 22 years ago that we lost her to that, but that 22 years uh, of time in medicine is like light years of change of technology and uh, um, medicine. Can we, do you feel comfortable talking about uh, um, your cancer and how T3 helped? Yeah, you bet. And, and blessings on the, the memory of, of your mom. I dare say I'm uh, alive now and taking medications uh, that just weren't on the market. They just plain weren't invented, you know, yet uh, at, at the time of her loss. Uh, so uh, my multiple myeloma story, and uh, I never heard of the word, uh, the phrase uh, bone marrow cancer I, I'd heard of, but no one in my immediate family had cancer. Uh, none of my closest friends uh, had a cancer. Uh, I thought I was a, a pretty healthy uh, guy at age oh, 54. I had just run the Honolulu Marathon uh, less than a year prior to my diagnosis. I had a pain in my leg that wouldn't go away. Uh, my idea of medicine for the past uh, 20 plus years was Motrin or Tylenol uh, or take a day off work if, if really necessary. Uh, but even that wasn't helping at this point. So uh, we discovered a, a pretty significant sarcoma or, or tumor uh, on my right femur. And uh, we took a, a complicated series of batteries of tests after that. Uh, and I asked uh, the doctor, uh, where else might it have uh, spread? And he declared it would be easier to tell you where it isn't. Uh, at this point. 
right? So it was a, a real holy gosh moment. Uh, and this was in December of 2014. At the time, I was a, a two-star admiral. I was the director of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon. Uh, so I informed the chairman I wouldn't be coming to work uh, here for a bit, and we came up with a succession plan uh, and uh, I had the full support uh, of the chairman and the staff. Uh, and over the course of the next year, I went through several surgeries, several procedures, a stem cell transplant, uh, and I was really on the ropes, and the outcome was uncertain on more than one occasion. Uh, but uh, I applied the professional framework of teamwork, tone, tenacity uh, at first. Uh, my team, well, it wasn't my office team any longer. I needed to build relationships, establish trust and loyalty with doctors and nurses and administrators, you know, and cleaning people, right? Uh, because at, at one point after a stem cell transplant, I was neutropenic right? and, uh, you know, completely without an immune system. So my environment needed to be sterile and spotless, right? So they were just as important to me as a, a doctor uh, at that point. Uh, the tone, uh, my wife, my friends, my family, they all contributed to make sure that I was uh, having fun is probably a stretch, but being of good humor. So they did their best to inject, you know, a positive tone uh, into my hospital room. Uh, but it's also incumbent upon leaders, right? This is uh, the Admiral's Almanac, right? Admirals are leaders, and uh, something I realized along the way, but really emphasized uh, during this hospital stay, which was about six weeks, that uh, leaders need to generate their own morale. As much as others will try and uh, move you along, if you can't self-generate uh, uh, that uh, level of a positive mood, uh, then uh, uh, others will have a tougher time following you. And the tenacity was pretty apparent. Uh, I just saw this uh, as literally a fight to the finish, right? And uh, it was me, Bugs Bunny, you know, versus cancer as Yosemite Sam, right? <laughs> and I was not going down, right? And uh, Bugs always found a way, you know, to uh, come out on top. And uh, I thought that was a, a pretty good role model for me in this case. And very unorthodox, you know, which I was open to trying novel treatments, you know, and entering uh, into new trials. And uh, thank God, you know, here I am. Well, a absolutely. And I thank God as well that you're here because life is too short not to know uh, uh, Paul Becker and uh, the experiences that you give others um, as a keynote speaker. And so you've gotten rave reviews uh, as a speaker, and it's easy to um, see here. Now, um, we talked about the the trinity of uh, T3, but you also mentioned faith, family. Was it faith, family, and friends? Uh, yeah, there, there are a number. I have some interchangeable pieces there, but uh, faith, family, fitness. Oh, fitness, that's friends, right. Friends, fun. Or, you know, now I'm not going to make a, uh, pen, uh, I, you know, it, well, there, there's a, you know, there, there's a word for a six uh, sided figure, you know, sesahedron, uh, something like that. But uh, let's just say five. I, I, I have five interchangeable pieces, but back to people remember things in threes. Right. So let's just call it uh, faith, uh, family, uh, and fitness. Uh, absolutely. No, um, I give testimony to my personal uh, life in that um, I forced my career up until lieutenant commander to be extremely successful. And uh, as my wife and I would teach uh, marriage prep, I would say uh, my priorities there as a lieutenant commander where everybody wanted to fly with me, drink with me, uh, deploy with me, go on liberty with me, that my priorities were Gary number one, Gary, number two, Gary, number three, and Darlene would add, and Gary, number four. And <laughs> at, 
at that point, she challenged me and said, so where, where are we going in our life? What's, uh, what's going on? She asked me some very difficult questions, pointed at all the men in naval aviation that were divorcing their wives. And uh, I had to answer those questions. Thank God she's a strong, powerful woman of faith. And so through a six-month process, I changed and my priorities became faith, family, uh, Navy, and from there, my career took off, I mean, like a skyrocket. And it wasn't that I degraded the Navy mission, but in the process of, you know, um, having faith, I think is, uh, and um, you and I are from different faiths, but uh, the same faith in, in, a, in a way that there's a higher being guiding our lives. And as you said, man plans, God uh, laughs. So uh, faith, I think, is a tremendous uh, uh, leg of uh, any triangle whether it be in leadership or in uh, um, healing and medicine. And I think you have to have that uh, uh, leg to, you know, you can't just be, a, if you're just a secular leader, you can throw anything away. Yeah, fun didn't apply uh, while I was going through uh, my cancer treatments. Uh, and uh, for the record, I, I'm uh, I'm in a good a stringent, complete response is the the, uh, the medical technical uh, phraseology or a good stable remission right now. But I still receive the three treatments per month mm-hmm. uh, to make sure we maintain the upper hand. You know, back to some of our opening comments. Uh, it's uh, it's not a, a final decision, but right now we're in uh, control and uh, that's where we want to be. And uh, until someone wins that Nobel Prize, right, for curing multiple myeloma, this is my way ahead. And it's a minor inconvenience, you know, considering the alternatives. And uh, I share this. I speak uh, often with medical audiences, not just patients, uh, but providers as well. And I have a unique patient perspective uh, in that uh, as a senior officer to include service uh, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, actual uh, for uh, for a year and a half, uh, there were people in my uh, charge that ended up in a hospital, and then uh, I did myself not not as a combat uh, wounded warrior, uh, but in the same hospital with them. So I had a unique uh, patient's perspective uh, that I offer uh, to the medical professionals of you know. Here's my uh, here's my look at it, you know, from the pillow up, right, and instead of from the leader down. Yeah, a- abs- absolutely. Now, um, you say the fun wasn't in there, but I find that whenever I'm under stress, I get uh, funnier in in many regards. But uh, um, but putting it back to our original military um, approach to leadership, uh, I think um, cancer became the enemy. And you determined what does the cancer not want you to know? And, uh, you know. Yeah, and that's the best tip I can give any cancer patient of, of any sort, right? This is the enemy. You need to fight it. You need to beat it. You need to get it on the ground and choke it out. Right. Well, how do you do that, you know, uh, practically? Well, it's learn everything possible. Uh, you know, there's some dangerous routes if you just start going uh, on the web, right? But find out what are the authoritative sources and then become a true subject matter expert. So this way, when you're having a conversation, and, and that's what I recommend, don't wait for the doctor uh, to tell you, uh, here's the plan. Be an active part of that discussion, Hey, doctor, you mentioned this, but I've also read about this. You know, what are your thoughts? And be a a participant and a contributor uh, to the dialogue. And there are often multiple options that one can take in terms of treatment. Uh, I actually had a doctor that was a a little more conservative on uh, what they thought would be the best course of treatment for me. Uh, But I wanted to take a, a path uh, that was a little more aggressive, you know, with a higher dose uh, a chemotherapy uh, with uh, a stem cell transplant, although it was not uh, absolutely necessary. 
but I thought uh, it was closer to the standard of care that I wanted to receive. So I was able to have those conversations because uh, I researched and uh, found out what the enemy didn't want me to know. Right. Absolutely. Now, um, when I lost, uh, when we lost our uh, father-in-law uh, to lung cancer, I told him, I said, dad, you don't, you don't have cancer. The whole family has cancer. And that goes to the, uh, the teamwork approach that when you have a diagnosis like this, the entire family is, uh, uh, has cancer. If you will, you might be the primary patient. And when I say that my, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And so I advocate for men, know your numbers. It's the most curable cancer out there. And if it kills you, it's because men are afraid to talk about anything between their thigh bone and their diaphragm. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't poke it. Don't pull it. Don't prod it. But, uh, you know, um, and that goes to your point of being actively participant and knowing uh, your situation. But it was my wife did some research that I, she, when we went to uh, Walter Reed, uh, mentioned to the radiation guys, when we speak to the surgeon, I want to ask her about cyber knife and the radiation oncologist said it's neither cyber nor a knife it's a uh, uh, targeted radiation so uh, we went that route and I'm, uh, now have a ponytail I'm a disciple for um, cyber knife for that kind of uh, treatment but uh, yeah yeah so it, yeah it's it's teamwork it's tone and it's tenacity and I'm sure there were times that uh, you were exhausted uh, that you were emotionally depleted and it was your faith that said, all right, Paul, you know, quit your whining and let's get back to the. Tenacity. Yeah, it's a real uh, it's a real strength multiplier, you know, uh, aids the tenacity yeah. right? uh, by, by giving you an inner strength. So, all right. Any so any uh, wrapping up thoughts on uh, leadership in our experience or adventures or um how, well, how can we get a hold of you? We want to have you as our keynote speaker to our group. How do we get a hold of you? Oh, you can find me on uh, multiple social media sources. Uh, start with my website. It's thebeckert3group.com, all one word, thebeckert3group.com. Uh, I have a footprint on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, you could find Paul Becker and the Becker T3 group uh, on those uh, sites. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time uh, with corporate audiences uh, nowadays uh, as well. I'm a member of a couple of corporate boards and, and also on several boards of advisors, but I speak uh, at corporate offsites uh, to uh, uh, C-suite uh, executives and uh I talk about teamwork, tone, tenacity, but in the context of the business world and how it translates to uh, what a boardroom understands is performance, productivity, and profit, right? In uniform, we think about combat readiness, right? That's what we're getting paid for. Can you fight your helicopter tonight and win? Right. That, that's what your boss wanted to know. Right. When you were, uh, you know, a, a younger officer yeah, uh, in the business world. Right. It's, it's not a fight to win uh, per se, uh, but it's all right. How do we best the competition? Right. How do we increase performance and productivity for our bottom line? Not combat readiness, but profit. Uh, and uh, I translate these principles, and, and that's very rewarding. And I like doing that uh, in the boardroom uh, instead of the battlefield. You know, it's a lot safer. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. When you're on the two-way rifle range, uh, things change. So mm-hmm. uh, those that do not follow you on LinkedIn should follow you on LinkedIn, where you almost, I think that you have a daily T uh, three um, leadership update, and usually you take some uh, celebrity or individual or organization and, and explain how they have uh, teamwork, tone, and tenacity. Do you have a um, a recent favorite uh, example of teamwork, tone, and tenacity that you want to share with us? Oh, let's see. Well, we're we're coming up on uh, uh, tomorrow uh, is Lou Gehrig Day in Major League Baseball. You know, the full package of teamwork, tone, tenacity. Uh, 
played second fiddle, uh, you know, to Babe Ruth, you know, and uh, batted behind him, uh, took himself out of the lineup for the betterment of the team, although he didn't know he had what's now called Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS. Uh, he thought that was best for the Yankees. If you've ever listened to the comments of his farewell address, uh, he talks about right now he considers himself the luckiest guy on the face of this earth, right? Because of the love of his family and teammates. Uh, and he was a devout man as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And his tenacity uh, along the way. It wasn't until 58 years later that Cal Ripken broke his uh, consecutive game streak of 2,130 games. But you think about it, uh, it may not be as dangerous as professional football or, or ice hockey in terms of the wallop uh, that one gets. But Lou played for 2,130 games, you know, through injury and pain and personal circumstances. And that's incredible tenacity putting others, the team. Uh, before self. So, you know, that's a, that's a real nice one. Well, Paul, uh, thank you. This has been a pleasurable uh, 45 minutes uh, uh, with you. And I think our listeners will enjoy learning about teamwork, tone and tenacity, about fighting cancer, about being a positive leader, having the correct uh, sense of humor and leadership, and also to have a foundation of faith and family. So final words to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, shipmate. Uh, teamwork, tone, tenacity can apply to any aspect of one's life, right? It can be in a family situation. It could be in a professional situation. It could be in a medical situation. It could be in good times. It could be in bad times. Uh, and it's easy to remember. It's actionable. And you could really check to see how you're doing in each one of those categories when you're wondering, uh, am I hitting the mark? Is our team uh, hitting the mark here? And uh, that's what I'll leave you with, teamwork, tone, tenacity. Thank you. And thank you, Paul Becker, Rear Admiral, United States Navy, retired. And remember to subscribe to the Admiral's Almanac wherever you get your podcasts. And so until we meet again, here's wishing you a happy voyage home.